Thanks for tuning in to the Women's Vibrancy Code, a podcast dedicated to helping women move from exhausted to energized, balance their hormones, and feeling turned on by their life, their lover, and themselves. I'm your host, Mariah Brown. I'm a Yale and functional medicine trained women's health expert, midwife, mom, keynote speaker, and self-made entrepreneur. I'm the founder of my signature program, the Women's Vibrancy Code. So sit back relax, and let's chat about your energy, hormones, libido, and embracing your feminine power. Oh, and you might want to have pen and paper to take some notes on some of these episodes. I'm so excited for today. We're going to talk about hormones and hormone replacement therapy in a very new and different way. I have Jill Klimilewski. Very close. Shimileski. But that was good. <laughs> that was a great effort. <laughs> We've had this conversation before. It's so hard. Shim- Shimileski. Yes. Yes. And it's those three consonants. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about hormones, all things hormones. And uh, we'll get into the nitty gritties of hormone replacement therapy specifically. It's one of Jill's fortes. And also it's my chance just to kind of pick her brain um, and learn. I, you know, I, I tend to be someone who's not quick to recommend bioidentical hormones early on. And I get the impression that Jill's a little bit more swift and um, and I'm really open to learning and looking forward to just kind of having a banter. Okay, let me read Jill's bio. And it's fascinating. She lives in Chicago, but right now we're recording this in winter and she's down in Arizona, uh, staying nice and warm. And Jill, I didn't tell you, I'm going to be in Tucson in three weeks, I think. Oh, same state. We'll be in the same state. Uh, We can wave from afar. Yes. All right. So Jill is a registered nurse, a certified health coach, an advocate for aging women and mom of four who is on a mission to change the way we approach menopause and aging. She helps midlife women break free from the mainstream way of thinking where disease and decline are accepted as an inevitable part of aging and embrace the notion that it's possible to feel vibrant, happy, healthy, balanced, and strong through midlife and beyond. Sound familiar (laughs) for anyone who's in my space? Um, Jill believes education is the key to helping women understand their bodies manage their health and advocate for themselves as they age. Jill created the Perry to Menopause Roadmap and the Beginner's Guide to Hormone Replacement Therapy to help women navigate the wild ride from perimenopause through menopause and beyond. In 2022, she launched Pausing Together, an online community for women to connect, learn, and open up discussions on topics that affect pausal women. Jill has been called upon as a puzzle guest expert on Women's Health Unplugged, the Period Party podcast, the Hormonality Speaking podcast, the Hormone Balance Solutions podcast, the Forever Chick podcast, um, Corporate Wellness Partnership Uncomfortable Conversation series, and here on the Women's Vibrancy Code podcast. Now you can add that to your list, Jill. (laughs) (laughs) Jill was recently invited to join the Institute of Bioidentical Medicine Medical Advisory Board, whose mission is to improve the standard of care of um, hormone medicine. So she's got lots of credentials, BSN and RN, to name a couple, and certification through the Institute of Integrative Nutrition, Functional Nutrition Alliance, and School of Applied Functional Medicine. Hi, Jill. Hi. Wow. What an introduction. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And anything today. else up front that you want to add? No, this is great. This is just perfect. Okay. So let's start out talking just like broad strokes hormones. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if we start with sex hormones, you know, let's start with estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, maybe DHEA, mm-hmm. um, you know, the big guns. Yeah. Can you just give a brief synopsis of what do they do? How how does estrogen serve a woman's body? Um, How does progesterone serve a woman's body? How does it make us feel? And, and And what do those hormones then affect? 
Yeah. So broadly speaking, I think, I think this is where women, um, I want to say get tripped up, but I think this is why this is such an important conversation because growing up, we tend to think about hormones in the context of periods and pregnancy. And what we know is that physiolo- in, in the body, from a physiological perspective, hormones extend, their benefits extend well beyond periods in pregnancy and reproductive function. I almost wish we weren't calling them sex hormones, so to speak, because I think it just, we're instantly tied then to the reproductive organs versus thinking about the body as a whole. So, you know, when we think about all of the hormones you just listed, all of those hormones have the way that hormones work. And you know this, but for a refresher, I mean, hormones work in the body by they're produced in the glands and organs. They go, they travel through the bloodstream and they arrive at a cell somewhere that there is a target receptor. They have to nestle into the receptor. So that sort of tells us, you know, if a cell has a receptor for a hormone, then that cell really thrives with the help of that hormone. Every cell of the body has receptors for all of the hormones you just listed. So, you know, kind of broadly speaking, if we think about it, estrogen, yes, it has a lot to do with, we kind of think about estrogen and progesterone as um, this kind of balance. They're both balancing each other out. They're like, you know, sort of like um, they're like a partner or couple, then they are lifelong partners. So estrogen is more of that proliferative growth, energizing hormone. Progesterone is more of that calming, um, relaxing, anti-anxiety Hormone, so control growth. So we want both and we want both in balance. There's a lot of nuances to estrogen. There's different types of estrogen. Some are more proliferative, some are less proliferative, the type of receptor matters. So there's more to it, but it really is more about this balance between the two. Um, when estrogen is flowing through our body, we do, we feel energized. We think about that first half of the menstrual cycle. Once our period is sort of ended and going into further into our menstrual cycle, we've got our energy back. We're heading towards ovulation. We can feel that we feel good in our bodies. When estrogen is flowing, we sleep well, um, you know, and then things start to shift. Progesterone has a, has a wonderful role in the body. It's very calming and anti-anxiety can also help us with sleep. So you know, the two in balance, it's really always about balance. They work really well hand in hand. Yep. Um, estrogen makes us juicy. I always think like, think about, you know, hydration and juiciness. When women say I have dry hair, dry skin, dry eyes, dry vagina, we're always thinking estrogen. We need that estrogen. Mm-hmm. So there's really a lot more to it, but kind of high level, that's where we're going. Testosterone, you know, I sort of, you know, we think about it, women tend to think about it as this male hormone because it's considered an androgen hormone, but it's a human hormone. And we have as much testosterone in the body as we do estrogen. So to sort of paint the picture of what estrogen does, I always think, I hate to go back to the male model, but if you think about this, like strapping young 20 something, you see this like confident guy walking in a room with muscles. And maybe that's what you picture. I guess that's what I picture, but these, these young guys, that's sort of what testosterone does at its peak. It gives us our muscles. It gives us our oomph, our memory, our motivation, just all of those things are libido. There's so many things tied to testosterone. It's protective in the breast it does so many more things in the body than I think what women are expecting. We're thinking about it for men, but it really is important for women as well. Mm-hmm. And DHEA, same thing. There's a lot of sort of similarities between DHEA. That's really the precursor to um, estrogen and testosterone. So Um, It does have a lot of the same impact. It can have some of the same effects that you see with testosterone, but um, other hormones are made from DHEA. So it's a really, really important hormone as well. This is awesome. Thank you. One of the things that uh, I'm surprised at, and I would love to hear your feedback. I'm surprised at how many women will come to me and they'll say, I don't have a uterus. My OBGYN prescribed me estrogen and no, I didn't get any progesterone because my OBGYN said, I don't need it since I don't have a uterus. Um, What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, again, I just, it's debunking these myths. I think I always go back to the OBs and I, and it's not to paint a bad picture about OBGYNs, but they're really trained for pregnancy, fertility, gynecological issues, delivering babies and surgery. They're, they're really not trained to take care of 
you know, or the hormonal issues with women, as we see, they're oftentimes, you know, prescribing things like the birth control pill as sort of a, a catch-all for all things hormone related. That's just not in their wheelhouse of how they've been trained. So I think when, when just what you just described in terms of having a hysterectomy or ha not having a uterus, they're thinking about hormones in the context of the uterus only and not thinking about that broader picture. So we need both hormones. We need them in balance. We have a hundred times more progesterone in the body than we do estrogen. So I always tell women and it declines, you know, it's more swiftly and earlier than estrogen. So that's why we start to see those changes happening earlier. If we don't have, if we don't have a uterus, we still need progesterone because again, we have those receptors throughout the body, the brain, the bones, the blood vessels all throughout the body. So we want to make sure we have hormones across the spectrum and in balance. Thank you. So yeah. for those of you that listen to me, you're not just hearing it from me, but also hearing it from Jill. Yeah. And, you know, I did my CNM training at Yale and I was taught the same thing. It's so myopic just thinking about the uterus and bleeding, but we have to remember all of the other ways in which these hormones impact our bodies. Um, before I move on, any other hormones, I mean, there's so many, there's thyroid and cortisol, yeah. any other hormones that for you, you feel that feel, feel really important to also speak to before we, um, before I move on to the next question. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, thyroid hormones, certainly super important. I think, especially when we're talking about perimenopausal and menopausal women. So I always just say pausal women as sort of a catch-all because there is just this spectrum from perimenopause to menopause to postmenopause. It's a span of like you know, it can be 40 years. So I say these pausal women, when hormones are changing, um, you know, we tend to start seeing more changes with thyroid hormones. We want to be aware that that's a really important hormone and they work as a family. So when one is affected, it's going to affect everything else. Um, insulin is a very important hormone, especially as we go through perimenopause. I mean, throughout our life, it's certainly important, but insulin and blood sugar issues are going to have a big impact on our other hormones as well. So all hormones are important. I think that's the big, the sort of the big takeaway. We tend to kind of cherry pick one is more important than the other, and they're all so important. So I don't want to leave any out, but when I think about those kind of top picks going into, especially the perimenopausal years, though, there's the ones I'm thinking about. I mean, cortisol certainly as well. Um, it's a, it's a little bit bigger of an animal, but I'm, I'm I guess I, you know, they're all important. That's probably the best way to say it. Yeah. And yeah. I love that you brought up insulin. So for the people that are listening and they're like, wait a minute, I think I know insulin has something to do with diabetes and diabetes has something to do with sugar, but you're saying insulin is a hormone. Mm -hmm. Can you just also give just a broad help the listeners understand what is insulin and from and and how do you describe it as a hormone mm -hmm. and how is it impacting our bodies? Well, insulin is made in the pancreas. So that's an endocrine organ and it is um, needed in order to usher glucose into our cells. So what that means is if we eat a meal that contains carbohydrates, sugar, any kind of glucose, it get, you know, we eat it, we digest it, it gets sent into our bloodstream, the glucose, and it's sent out to our cells to give our cells energy. And insulin is sort of like the way that glucose enters the cell, it needs some help getting into that cell. And insulin is sort of that helper hormone that helps to kind of like unlock the cell, open up the cell so that it can receive glucose. And for women that have, you know, blood sugar issues, um, we see it it's, and it's rampant in the United States for sure. I mean, I think, you know, the predictions are really half the population, you know, will be, uh, di have diabetes in the next like 10 years. So it's a really big problem. Insulin is that really major hormone that has to do with blood sugar balance and other things as well, but its primary role is really when it comes to balancing blood sugar and helping our cells to get the energy that they need. And I know a lot of the work that you do is, is specifically in this puzzle, you know, the perimenopause and menopause, and, we're, and I'm going to, that will be the next question for you mm -hmm. to really help women understand what that is. But, you know, I'm thinking as early as age 35. And so for that woman, yes, if you're um, 35 and, and even younger, this is, this is also relating to you. So I want you to listen up. And if you're way beyond menopause in your 60s, 70s, this conversation is also relating to you. Um, how do you describe the way in which insulin is shifting as we age and our sensitivity and receptivity of insulin is changing as we age? Yeah. So estrogen and insulin are really good friends as well. I mean, we really, when estrogen declines, 
we start to see a major impact on insulin. We become more insulin resistant. I mean, there's a multitude of factors at play, but insulin and estrogen go very much hand in hand. So when we see estrogen decline, we're going to see more, we tend to see an increase in issues with insulin and blood sugar balance and things like that. Um, and so that's where it becomes really, really important for us to be paying attention to, um, you know, our blood sugar, because um, we become more resistant. A lot of it having to do with diet as well. We are such a processed food society and we bring in a lot of stuff. And it's sort of like with insulin, I think about it as sometimes I describe it to patients as um, if you think about like, if you're a mom, you can relate to this. If you say to your kids, Hey, I need you to take the garbage out or let the dog out or whatever, you know, we're constantly like barking these orders at our kids to tell them what to do. And after a while, they just tune us out and they just don't even hear what we have to say anymore. It's like that's Charlie sort of, Brown. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, that's sort of insulin. It's like, you know, we, our body is sort of um, insulin be kind of the insulin receptors become sort of dull to insulin. There's so, there's so much sugar coming in all the time that it's almost like they just sort of shut down. They're not as receptive to insulin. They become more dulled. I think a lot of the chemicals in the world are also mucking with a lot of our hormone receptors, including insulin receptors. So that's a big yeah. piece of the puzzle as well. But bringing in carbohydrates and stress is also a big one to increase glucose. So our body needs to make more insulin. And so it becomes like the boy who cried wolf where we're making so much of this. After a while, our body just sort of you know becomes dull to this to this hormone, these receptors just sort of turn off or aren't as sensitive. And so we start to have more issues as we age. Yeah, I love. And, and I, you know, I love that you brought up food and processed foods. You know, often I'll speak with a woman who she's gluten-free and she's dairy-free and she's sugar-free and she's, you know, how awesome on one hand, mm -hmm. but then when you look at what's actually being eaten, it's just a, a bunch of kind of processed replacements that all happen to have the label gluten-free, or I think about myself in high school in the, you know, in the early nineties, <laughs> everybody was saying no sugar. So I remember yes. going and getting Entman's brownies and I was so proud of them and rice. I would eat rice for lunch <laughs> and Entman's brownies because I was so proud of myself. Yes. It was fat free. It was, yes. fat. It was fat free. Mm -hmm. And yet look at what I was loading my body with. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's really the whole foods are where it's at. And I think, you know, like to your point, that's a great point that you just said about gluten and dairy free, because I think it's seen as like this healthy option and it really depends on the person it might be, but if we're replacing it with a bunch of, you know, not so great options, it really isn't yeah. that much better for us. Yeah. So can you just tell your story a little bit? Um, what's your yeah. background? Uh, you, there, you must have a personal story with, with your hormone journey specifically to be this passionate yeah. about it. What brought you here and, and what kind of keeps you ticking, keeps you inspired to do the work? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I would say I was always in the women's health space, almost always as a nurse and early on. So I've been a nurse for 30 years and early on, I always, I sort of thought this, our medical system didn't make sense. It was like, we're just treating people um, there's no prevention. And so I started thinking more and more about that. And so I, that's how I ended up in the functional health space. I started to become a health coach and really saw that I wanted to learn more about the way the body worked. And in that process, I started learning a lot about hormones. And this was during the time, this is probably my early forties um, to mid forties where my hormones were changing as well. And as, as I started working with clients and patients, I was seeing a lot of the issues that they were facing, experiencing a lot of them myself. And sort of realizing, because I had started diving deep into hormones, that hormones had a lot to do with their symptoms. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, I never planned to end up in the menopausal space. In fact, I really didn't have any interest in working with menopausal women. Those old women is what I thought, to be honest. But the more I got into it, the more I realized how, much, how little we know about our hormones as women. Mm. And I just, I don't know, it unleashed something in me that... I feel this just great passion and drive to make sure that women understand their body so that they can really participate in their care, not just during perimenopause and menopause, even before that, um, but that when they go into this, they go into it eyes wide open. And for me, it was a lot of, you know, you're, you're on, you know, you're making a lot of calls, you're on a lot of websites, you're doing a lot of research, a lot of articles. And so I really wanted to just make this simpler for women. And so this has really become sort of a, as I say, like 
the second half of my life passion to just help women. I'm hoping that our, our daughters don't have to go through um, the perimenopause menopausal experience in the same way we have, because it's a really, for a lot of women, a very difficult experience simply because our providers are not in the know. We're not in the know and our providers are not in the know. And that's something that I really want to change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing the work that you do. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about perimenopause. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is it not? Who, who is it? Who is it affecting? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Perimenopause is such a, well, let's start with menopause because I think we think about menopause as this very finite point in time. And it happens way, way, way later. I'll be 50 something. And this thing happens. And the only thing most of us are really thinking about with menopause is hallelujah. I don't have to deal with my period anymore. It's done, you know, and that's it. And then we move on. Um, so that the average age for, for menopause is 51. So if we work backwards, so let's think about menopause at 51, our hormones peak in our twenties. So there's a span of time between our twenties and 51 where something is happening and that's perimenopause. Now I wouldn't say perimenopause for most women is happening in their twenties or late twenties. Um, but, but we are having our peak hormonal output from our ovaries in our twenties, typically in our mid twenties. So after that, we're starting to have some hormonal decline. We're typically not going to have the same robust amount of hormones that we had in our, in our twenties, when we reach our early thirties, unless we're pregnant, typically sometime in our mid to late thirties is when perimenopause happens. And all that really means is our hormones are changing, but now they're changing a little bit more. Um, aggressively, it's accelerating a little bit. And so it's typically marked by first a decline in progesterone, maybe just a couple of cycles per year where we don't ovulate. We may not know that we're not ovulating. We may still get a period, but typically women are having like maybe one to two cycles where they're not ovulating. And that's when we make progesterone. That's when we make this really robust amount of progesterone. So we may find that a couple of those cycles per year, we're a little bit off, you know, maybe we're starting to clue into it. Progesterone is starting to go kind of on this decline, typically following that during perimenopause, that's kind of early perimenopause. There's a period of time where estrogen starts to fluctuate. We think about estrogen typically as going low, but really there's a period of time where it's going up, down, up, down, up, down. And sometimes it's going to go higher than it's ever been. Even in our reproductive years, it's just our ovaries trying to sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's all about the hormonal feedback system and our body's losing estrogen. So we're trying to burst out more estrogen. So we get these highs and lows and highs and lows. And that's typically when women will really start to clue into symptoms and say, gosh, I feel fine. No, I don't feel fine. I'm crying. I'm not crying. I'm, you know, there's all of these things. I'm, you know, I'm having hot flashes. I'm having night sweats. There's just all kinds of feelings until then, typically the one to two years before menopause, when estrogen starts on that more steady decline. So there's Mm -hmm. sort of a process there with hormones. It's a little bit different for everyone, but that's the general um, um, sort of sequence of things happening. And, you know, I've seen sort of the research showing it can be two years, it can be 12 years. I would be surprised for any woman if it was a two year span of time, it really tends to happen over probably more like a decade at least. Um, testosterone will start to decline somewhere in there. Some women come into perimenopause with low testosterone. Some women, it's a little bit later. Some women will have a little bit of a surge in testosterone at some point, but that too will decline. And so when we reach menopause, you know, not only are hormones low, but they'll continue to decline. That's why I say it's really this pausal spectrum because it doesn't just end with menopause. It starts with perimenopause but it continues to decline and goes down even after menopause. Mm-hmm. And for the woman who has a total hysterectomy, yeah, or so that's, yeah. they've had a, or the woman who says, I had a hysterectomy, but I still have my ovaries. Does that influence anything? Can you speak it to both does. of this? Yeah. So if you have a total hysterectomy, which means you've had both your uterus and ovaries removed, you really are just sort of then thrown into menopause, full-blown menopause. Women who have had uh, their uterus removed, but have kept their ovaries. It's interesting. The research shows that, you know, they will still be, you know, functioning. They'll have, they'll be in perimenopause. They'll still have some hormone production. 
oftentimes just because we've cut through something, we've severed something, things are not connected the way they once were. So oftentimes women will have a little bit of shift with hormones if they've had their uterus taken out as well. That's something that women definitely want to pay attention to, because I think a lot of women are thinking, well, I have my ovaries but I don't have my uterus, but that can still be impacted. Or if one ovary was taken out, oftentimes women will still have, you know, a change in their hormones. I mean, they will have a change. Sometimes their body will kind of accommodate and shift and try to, you know, um, you know, help them out. The other ovary will sort of pick up speed, but that's not always the case. Yeah. And going back to your early comment around every cell having a receptor that's going to be like, I think of a lock and key, that 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 lock that's ready for the key, which in the key being the the hormone. Mm -hmm. It's probably fair to say that the uterus is has the strongest of those receptors that have the pull for estrogen and progesterone, theoretically. Possibly. I don't know. I don't know if you, I, I would think probably, a good, I mean, obviously a good portion of those receptors are concentrated there, but the brain has a ton mm-hmm. of estrogen receptors, mm-hmm. you know, the muscles do um, obviously the, not only the uterus, the vagina, so that tissue, they're just, yes, the reproductive yeah. organs are flush, mm-hmm. but it's really surprising when you look throughout the body, the digestive tract is loaded with estrogen receptors. So women will often find that they start to experience digestive issues when their hormones go down. So it's these subtleties that I think we're so unaware of because most of us didn't learn that at any point in time. And so we're really surprised that, well, I don't have hot flashes. Well, that's not, you know, that's just, that's a symptom. And that's just one little piece of the puzzle. Yeah. It's really, but you're right. I mean, I think the uterus is obviously very flush. And I think that also could speak to the woman who goes, Oh, I only had two years of quote unquote perimenopause. Well, maybe they only had two years of night sweats and hot flashes, but all the other subtle symptoms that I'm hearing you speak of, I mean, even like progesterone being a calming hormone that helps with sleep, it could be just a little bit more muscle tension or a little bit more restless leg or a little bit more difficulty with sleep. Um, You're talking about estrogen and, and its relationship with the gut. I mean, how many women come to you and me both complaining about gut stuff, bloating, gassiness, slower digestion, you know, there's so there's so many different ways in which the hormone changes in our body can be showing up changes in our body composition, a little bit of extra weight, a little bit new wrinkles. I mean, all of the things Um, I heard you. Oh, I heard a couple of things that I have questions about one being that a woman might might not ovulate and still bleed. Mm -hmm. and the the reduction in progesterone so i think of i think it's the period repair manual where she talks about the main event Mm -hmm. the main event being ovulation Mm -hmm. which is what stimulates the production of progesterone Mm -hmm. which so it makes sense to me as we start ovulating less often or haphazardly that's Mm -hmm. then going to decrease the production of progesterone because our body produces progesterone in response to ovulating Mm -hmm. but i've also been taught and understand that when we have a menstrual bleed, it's simply because we ovulated 12 to 14 days earlier. And yet I'm hearing you say that there's a possibility that we would have a menstrual bleed without ovulation. Mm-hmm. And I have a little bit of a jaw drop there. Um, how? Well, it's, it's, it's not probably a true menstrual period. I mean, we have this, uh, we have estrogen, thinking about estrogen. I remember a, a doc and I don't, I don't remember who it was describing, if you think about uh, if you think about the uterine lining as your lawn, your front lawn, estrogen is, you know, grows the lawn and progesterone is sort of the lawnmower that cuts the lawn. So that's mm-hmm. sort of what's happening in the uterine lining. So you've got estrogen building the uterine lining and progesterone that's make, controlling the growth of that uterine lining, keeping it intact. If we're, if we've, if we are producing some estrogen, but maybe we're not hitting that peak that's causing that ovulation, we still are growing a uterine lining. If we didn't produce progesterone, we may slough off some of that uterine lining without the progesterone. So it may not be that true full menstrual cycle, if you will, but it's really a bit of a, it is a bleed. We still are shedding some of our uterine lining. We just didn't ovulate. Right. Yeah. And so for women in the midst of perimenopause, they'll often report changes in menstrual cycle, a heavy bleed, Mm -hmm. a lighter bleed, some spotting haphazard, and likely that's what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of move into 
hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. Before I go there, anything else you want to add from anything we've talked about so far? No, I think this is great. This is okay. perfect. Yeah. Um, I love that you mentioned chemicals that we're exposed to and endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. So if there's time, I think that there's a lot of value in making sure that we talk about that a little bit. Yeah. But I want to really allow spaciousness and time for you to talk about hormone replacement therapy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first, non HRT options. <laughs> so yes. for a woman who's looking um, to support her foundational hormonal well being mm -hmm. from the perspective of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, and we've also brought up insulin. Mm -hmm. What are some broad stroke recommendations that you have for women in regard to lifestyle changes, diet modifications, testing, supplementation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, start there. Yeah, I mean, so foundationally, and in, and I always say this with HRT or without HRT, foundationally, we want to look at all of these things because they matter. I know we don't, we kind of poo poo a lot of these things that we were like, oh, whatever, just give me the supplement, give me the HRT, but they really work together. And I think even when we're thinking about hormones, hormones for hormone production, for hormones to signal receptors and for hormones to be broken down, they work very closely with nutrients and other cofactors in the body. So they're like best buds. So for them to work well, we need proper nutrients on board. We need to be getting protein. We need to have those amino acids. We need to get our vitamins and minerals. So just that whole foods diet um, is so, so important. Um, digesting well is important. We're a society that eats really, really fast. You know, we're washing our food down with water, trying to just get it in quickly. So chewing and putting a lot of emphasis on just the way we eat, I think is huge because that's how we're really going to be able to extract nutrients from the food that we're eating. That's the purpose of us eating, even though it's for enjoyment as well, but we want to make sure that we're eating well. Um, we want to be sleeping well. This is a really hard one for women in perimenopause oftentimes. And it's this vicious cycle where I hear, and it's sort of a pet peeve of mine because women will say, I want to sleep, but I can't sleep. And then I go to my doctor, my doctor says, well, you're, you know, decreased stress and, you know, you're doing too many things and you've got too many commitments and you need to exercise more and you need to do these things. Sometimes when hormones are changing, no matter what we do, um, we still aren't going to sleep well. So we can come back to the sleep thing, but I think sleep is an important thing for women to be thinking about. If you're not sleeping, we want to be tackling that in one way or another. So thinking about food, um, thinking about um, obviously exercise, sleep, stress is huge because again, that's going to have a huge impact on our hormone production, our hor whole hormonal system, um, on insulin and blood sugar balance, on cortisol. So those things really do matter. Um, in terms of like targeted nutrients, it really depends on what it's for. I mean, the big heavy hitters when it comes to hormone signaling are your B vitamins are very, very important, magnesium vitamin D, whether you're getting it from the sun or you're getting it in your body um, because you're taking a supplement. Um, zinc is really important at the hor in hormone receptors. There's something called a zinc finger. It's literally a zinc finger in the hormone receptor that is waiting for zinc to come by. So we need zinc for those hormones to signal properly. Um, we need iodine, we need vitamin A, we need vitamin C. So just kind of think broadly about these, um, you know, just vitamins, nutrients, minerals, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can use, I always say to women, this is always kind of a funny conversation when we get to like targeted, well, I, I don't want to use hormones because they're not natural, but I always say to women, okay, but, but herbs like bioidentical hormones are actually hormones are made in the body. So the body recognizes hormones. The receptors are waiting for hormones. Receptors know what to do with hormones. When we bring in something like an herb, not that that's a bad thing, but our, that's not made in the body. That's actually not identical to something that's made in the body. So our, it's not really like our receptors know exactly what to do with it. So I try to help women reframe even thinking about, you know, do I need to go straight to the herbs? Well, think about what we're, what's actually happening in the body. We're losing hormones. You can use herbs, you can use food. So soy signals estrogen receptors, and that can be very helpful for a lot of women. Flax seeds contain plant estrogens, um, we can use things like Vitex or Chase Tree for, especially for women who are, have issues with ovulation. Um, it typically doesn't help women very much when they are further along in perimenopause, but earlier on, it can typically be helpful. Maca can be helpful. There's some herbs like that that can be helpful. 
Um, let me think like, you know, there's some research about red clover and black cohosh and valerian and other um, herbs that can be very helpful to support the hormonal system along with adaptogenic herbs. I think you and I talked about that last time, very helpful just in general for the hormonal system. Yeah. Um, but they only, you know, they, they, they don't fully fill the shoes that our hormones have left behind. Cause those are really big shoes. So I always say they're going to pack a little bit of a punch, but not that kind of big punch yep. that hormones would bring in. Yeah. Yep. And so confession, this is yeah. really confession, but this is <laughs> it kind of is. So what I'm finding now is during my week three, so that, that PMS week, so no, mm -hmm. sorry, week four, I should, the PMS week yeah. of my menstrual cycle. Cause mine, you know, I'm 46. Mm -hmm. My cycles are still very regular every month. Um, I'm not noticing any distinct symptoms of perimenopause, although there was a chapter before I started making shift where I was noticing a change in my libido. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have the same resiliency to stay up as late at night. And I also choose not to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I'm not really focusing on my self-care, my brain fog shows up a little bit. So yeah. with that being said, like I said to you off camera, we have the vibrant CEO workshop this week. Um, I'm the week before I'm going to bleed, which often is the week that if I'm going to have disruption in my sleep, this is the week that it shows up that like two to 4 a.m. wake up where mm -hmm. I wake up with my mind buzzing and my body exhausted. And so I go, all right, I have bioidentical progesterone. Mm -hmm. And so I took progesterone last night to go, okay, I'm gonna make sure I'm gonna have a solid night's sleep. I'll often add it in just during this week of my cycle mm -hmm. to subsidize and give a little bit of extra, especially when I really know that my well being and how I serve is reliant on me having a good night's sleep. So yeah. mm -hmm. with that being said, let's talk about hormone replacement therapy. Yes. I'm, so I'm, we're, here's the deal. So first, the blanketed HRT versus bioidenticals. Mm -hmm. How does a woman know if she's on bioidenticals? Mm -hmm. And um, why would a woman look to get bioidenticals versus HRT? Yeah. So bioidentical hormones are just as their name sounds. I mean, they are synthesized in a lab. They're made from plants. So typically they're going to be made from um, soybeans um, and the tubers of wild gams. Um, you can't take these foods and get the same benefits. So you do need, they do. So essentially it is going to be, they will be made in a lab. So they are actually synthesized, but they are made into a bioidentical hormone. So it looks exactly like the hormone that's made in your body. Um, the difference between a bioidentical hormone and a synthetic hormone, and I call it a, I mean, it's really is a synthetic hormone. It doesn't have the same molecular structure as the hormones that are made in the body. Our hormone receptors don't know, you know, don't know exactly what to do with them because they're not exactly the same as hormones made in the body. If we were to measure, if we were to give someone HRT and it's synthetic, it isn't depending on, on what it is, it may not even get picked up in hormone testing because it's not recognized in sort of your traditional lab testing that's looking at bioidentical hormones. Um, hormones, anything that's made in the human body cannot be patented. The delivery system can be patented, but the, like a hormone itself cannot be patented. So there is not money to be made, if you will, in the pharmaceutical world on hormones, unless they are made, you know, unless it's on the delivery system or, and that's why really pharmaceutical companies came up with synthetic versions of hormones, because it's really, you know, we, if you've been in the medical world, as long as I have we know that the pharmaceutical industry is, it's a, it's a profit driven industry and that's how they make profits. They get patents. So that's where the focus will be. So um, how does a woman know you really, if you just read the label of your hormones, it, it will say, you know, estradiol. If it says anything else, it would say estradiol. That's the one of the hormones that's made in our body. So we make estrone, which we don't use in bioidentical hormone replacement, we would either use estradiol, one type of estrogen, or estriol, the another type of estrogen. If you get an estrogen prescription, it's going to say estradiol, or it will say estradiol and um, estriol, which is called biased, is a combination. If it says anything else, it's it's synthetic, so it will say that on the label. Same with progesterone; it will say progesterone, oral micronized progesterone. 
if it's, there's lots of versions, there's lots of other progestins out there. Um, but if it says anything other than progesterone, it's not bioidentical. It's not actual progesterone. Mm -hmm. And for those of you listening in the Women's Vibrancy Code podcast, you might want to go back. I interviewed Dr. Sarah Hill, who wrote Your Brain on the Pill. And we really did a bit of a deep dive into progestins specifically. And for those listening to this, where do most progestins come from? And why? In your words, why are they not, why are they kind of no bueno? Oh my gosh. They're, you know what? They are the opposite of the progesterone in our body. So we talk about progesterone as this calming hormone, right? It's just this anti-anxiety. It's relaxing. It has so many benefits in the body. Progestins really have the opposite effect. The only, the only thing they really share in common with progesterone is that they both control the growth of the uterine lining. Other than that, they really have opposite effects in the body. Um, progestins, as you're referring to, are taken orally, which increase our risk for clots. So that's not a good thing as well. But there's really, there's, it's really kind of, in my opinion, it's a really pretty nasty chemical, the progestins. And so, you know, why would we take a progestin when we have progesterone available? Um, and just to piggyback on, I wanted to just mention, I didn't earlier with estrogen, synthetic estrogen, it's made from the urine of a pregnant horse. And we only <laughs> share one estrogen with horses. Um, so you can imagine, it's not only about the fact that it's not the same estrogens in our body, but these horses are made to stay pregnant sort of indefinitely and then cath authorized to get their urine. So it's not nice to the horses either. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the labels of a lot of these synthetic um, chemicals, these synthetic hormones, it's not even just, you know, the horse urine, the mare's urine, the mare's, uh, the, the, the fact that the estrogen came from the horse, there's additives, there's other things that are not so nice for the body, especially when we're thinking about hormone disrupting chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so who might be a woman that would that we, you would ask to listen up and be open to the idea of starting bioidentical hormone therapy? I would say every woman. There's not a woman that I would say, I, I, I think, I wish we didn't call it HRT, honestly, because I think if you think about other hormones in the body, if a woman is diagnosed with type one diabetes and her pancreas is no longer making insulin, we would give her insulin. We wouldn't say, you know, you're going to live, you know, 30, 40 more years in this body, just kind of wing it. You know, you're not going to feel as great, but just kind of wing it. I realize they have different functions in the body, but when you understand the massive, massive role that hormones play in the body to expect our bodies to go, you know, 30, 40, sometimes 50 years with lower, no hormones, that's a big ask when you think about receptors throughout the body. So we know that these, we know that hormones play this massive role. So that's where I say, all women should be candidates for bioidentical hormones because all women make hormones. We've been, they've been flowing through our blood vessels since puberty. So we know how important they are. We've all had them in our body before. So they really shouldn't be restricted to anyone in particular. I think all women should be maybe open to the, to the possibility of, of thinking about hormones. And adding an end, mm -hmm. um, as our ovaries slow down, mm -hmm and we stop producing as much innate hormones, it's not that we have none. I mean, right. the adrenals are picking up, the brain, mm -hmm. the skin. I mean, those hormone production, the, the cells throughout the body other than the ovaries are still producing hormones. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing from you loud and clear is once a woman really crosses over age 35, you're really suggesting that she, especially if she's having symptoms, mm -hmm. that she benefits from adding in some bioidentical hormones. Well, yeah, the, you know, the, the thing is we're th thinking so much. I think it's menopause has been approached or treatment for menopause has been really all about symptom relief. It's the hot flashes. It's the night sweat. sweat. she's not sleeping, but behind the scenes, whether you're a woman that has symptoms or not, there are physiologic changes that are happening in your body silently. So you may not, you may not feel them. You may not feel your bones um, becoming more brittle, you know, right. becoming stiffer, more brittle. 
Um, we want flexible bones. We want strong bones, but they need to be flexible. That is really under the direction of hormones. Mm -hmm. um, our brains, we have tons of receptors in our brain. So if we don't have those hormones flowing to our brain, we do see changes in our hippocampus, our ability to store memory, to maintain memory, to learn new things. Um, our blood vessels, the moment we become menopausal and we, our estrogen drops, our risk for heart attack equals that of a man's. And it's simply because we've lost estrogen. They're so protective. Estrogen is so protective of the blood vessels in the body that mm -hmm. as soon as we lose estrogen, our blood vessels become more stiff, more sticky. So it's all of the things, the vagina, you know, and women are saying, well, I'm going to the bathroom three times a night. It's disrupting my sleep. Um, I have pain with sex. I mean, there's a million things that are happening down there. The changes in that, in that vaginal microbiome, it's really not healthy for the body. So that's why I would say it's about keeping like cellular peace in those tissues. We want those tissues to maintain integrity, the health of, and integrity. We're not bringing women back to levels they were in their twenties. It's low levels of hormone, but it's just enough to really protect the brain the bones, the blood vessels. And then we know it protects the rest of the body, including the digestive tract, the liver and everything else. Right. So we're yeah. talking not just treatment, but also prevention, just like we recommend eating a diet rich in plants. A hundred percent. To address the symptoms that you're having, but because we know that it's keeping you healthy for the long run. Okay. Yes. Okay. So a woman says, all right, I'm open. I, I get it. I want to try some bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. And then she says, well, where do I start? Who do I go to? I live in the middle of nowhere, Alaska. I live in a big city. My, my OBGYN says that he or she doesn't work with that thing, a compounding pharmacy. I don't even know what that is or where I would find it. Where does a woman start? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, there's, it's interesting because there aren't really, we're, we're starting to see more menopause specialists, but there, if you notice, you know, we have residency programs for urology and gynecology and orthopedic surgery and, you know, all of the different things, there isn't a residency program for menopause medicine. And there really should be, if you think about gynecologists and obstetricians who are spending all of their time learning how to deliver babies, not every woman is going to become pregnant, but every woman is going to go through perimenopause and menopause. So we do have, I will just say, we have a bit of a shortage of menopause providers. And so I always say to women, you do have to shop around. Um, it's not necessarily easy to find someone who is an expert in menopause medicine, but where I often find the best success in finding that person is to call, like you just referred to a compounding pharmacy. So Compounding pharmacies, for those of you that don't know, they're specialized pharmacies. Um, their pharmacists have gone through additional training. They're almost like chemistry specialists. And they actually, um, they customize not just hormones, all kinds of medications for people's unique needs. You know, special needs, maybe kids. Like I have a cousin who is spe who's special needs. Now she's 30, but they could make a lollipop. For, they could make her, her medication into a lollipop for her at the time because she maybe needed to take her medicine in a different way. They can make medications for pets. So they can customize medications, hormones, lots of other things for a woman's unique needs. They work very closely with menopause providers because menopause providers who are really spending the bulk of their time treating women are going to be working with compounding pharmacies to customize um, their prescription. So that's a great place to start, whether it's a local compounding pharmacy, even a compounding pharmacy in your state. Um, menopause lends itself beautifully to telehealth. So a lot of providers, as long as they're licensed in your state, will prescribe if they're in your state or you know, as long as they're there. Um, so you can call compounding pharmacies in sort of a wider area because these medications can be mail ordered as well. So just to kind of keep that in mind, um, that's probably my number one recommendation. Um, there are other places like the Institute for, of, for Functional Medicine. They have some providers you can search. They tend to be a little bit more conservative with their recommendations, always looking at lifestyle pieces first, which isn't a bad thing. But sometimes with the women who are doing everything they, in their power to feel good, they're doing all the lifestyle things. Um, and they still don't feel very well and they're still not getting sleep and they're hanging by a thread. You know, HRT is really, that's treating the root cause of what's happening in their body. And that's not always translated. I have found 
with some functional medicine providers, but that's mm-hmm. a place to go. Yes. A4M is another, um, you know, avenue that women can go. It's the, um, I think it's American Society for Anti-Aging Medicine or Anti-Aging. Yeah, I think it's A4M. It's just A, the number four, and then M. And they have providers who have gone through specialty training. Um, and then the menopause method, which is one of my favorites, they have a, a list of providers. And so that's a, a, you know, a possibility as well. So a few possibilities um, just to kind of do your research and, and find a provider. Um, I do think that women before even going that route, they're getting a little bit of pausal know-how under your belt so that you sort of know what you're asking for, what you're looking for, what kind of questions um, will kind of tease out whether this provider is right for you. It's, it's really helpful. It's not, it's not exhaustive. You don't have to research for, you know, months and months, but just get a little bit of kind of pausal know-how so that you know what you're you know, have a little bit of a a, kind of a list of questions Mm -hmm. sort of ask as you're researching providers. And I I love the simple thing of just finding a compounding pharmacy in your state Yeah, and asking that compounding pharmacy, what provider prescribes there. And you're right. Licensure is state specific. So you're in the same state. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not contingent on the zip code that you live in. Okay. How many women are now coming into my uh, programs and services talking about pellets. Okay, good. I see your facial expression. I'm like, no, (laughs) no, no. So I think I heard you at one point say that progestins come in oral. Progestins also come in patches and rings and the IUD and and pellets. Um, And so uh, can you speak a little bit to the woman who's been told, oh, we'll just give you a pellet or, oh, we'll just give you these, this hormone replacement therapy. And now they're loaded with all sorts of hormones and they're not bioidentical. And now they're stuck in their body for a good three months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the main one that really concerns me more than anything is testosterone pellets. And that's the one that, you know, for women that don't know testosterone, our pellets are about the size of a grain of rice and they are, I say surgically, but they are implanted under the skin and left in for they they basically pulse out testosterone over time. You can't control necessarily exactly how they're going to be released. And so what women will find is that they get these pellets implanted under their skin. They feel great the first time they do it. It's it's like an endorphin high. It's like that, you know, it's like it's like the sports, you know, the athletes will say that, you know, it's that steroid high. That's really sort of what it is because you felt so flat for so long. You're like, wow, I've got energy. I feel great. And unfortunately the dose, it's really what we call super physiologic doses. Very, very, very high doses. I mean, four five, six times as high, sometimes as high as, as dosing that you would see in a man. So these doses are really high and then you leave them in, they just dissolve over time. And then you have to go back and you have to get pellets put in again in a different location. Um, again, you almost have to go higher than the next time to get that same feeling. And what tends to happen over time is you have these super, super physiologic doses. And I always say about hormones, we want Goldilocks hormones in the body, not too much, not too little, just right. Hormones are great, but we don't want, like, I think oftentimes in the health and wellness industry, if a little is good, more is better. And that's not true. We really don't want to be going out there with hormones. We want just enough to protect the body and to really get us to a place where we're feeling good in our body. Um, Testosterone pellets go way, way, way high. And what tends to happen to women over time is they start to get um, that sort of those symptoms of excess testosterone. So not just things like oily skin and acne, but aggression, like serious aggression, hair loss. I have seen hair loss in women who have been on pellets, especially for maybe two or three cycles. So let's say they've been on it for about, you know, six, nine months or so tons of hair loss. Think about male pattern hair loss. And I was actually talking with a colleague who is a director of um, women's uh, or a hair restoration clinic who said, that's like her number one client coming in is wow. women who have lost. It, it's like just tons and tons of hair. It's really hard to get it back. It does a lot to those hair follicles. So it's really something that we want to avoid. The other thing with, with pellets is, and we didn't really talk about hormone titration, but with all hormones, the way we like to start them is we start low and we go slow and women are going to be the ones to say, okay, I've reached my right dose. You start low, you increase slowly, and then you find your right dose. You might hit a point of excess. Then you know, to go back down to the previous dose. And that's done along with your provider 
under the direction of your provider. With Telets, it's just this giant dose out of the gate. There's no titration. And we know every woman is different. So where, you know, I may thrive with really high testosterone levels because that's where I always was. Mariah, you may have come in over here and maybe you're better here. So titration with hormones is just really necessary when we're looking to get Goldilocks levels of hormones and pellets do not offer that at all. And, and I, they leave yeah. a lot of scar tissue in the area. I've, I've heard that after about a couple of years, there's almost no, no more areas to even implant them because they leave a lot of scar tissue under the skin. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad we're on the same page here. Okay. Yeah. So then for someone to figure out the finesse, the Goldilocks just right, there's blood yeah. testing, there's urine testing, there's saliva testing. We've already established that for a woman in that 35 to 55 age range, hormones are changing a lot and often spiking each month may be different. So we might test. And for me, I still love to test because it's something, mm -hmm. but we also take it with a grain of salt that this is just a snapshot in time. So if someone wants to try to make their bioidentical hormone replacement therapy prescription, so to speak, mm -hmm. super customized mm -hmm. for where they are in their scenario. What's your suggestion? Yeah. So it depends. I mean, again, it depends. It's so unique. And that's where these menopause specialists are. So they're trained. This is all they're doing. And that's why we want to find someone who isn't kind of doing it on the side. It isn't like, you know, 5% of their business. It's the bulk of their business. That's really what they're doing. So they know all of the nuances with prescribing. So we're typically starting low and slow. So with estrogen, estrogen is best given in a topical form. So typically it's going to be a cream, um, oil, or gel. I would say Mariah, the typical maybe starting dose. So everyone is different, but where most women land with estrogen or bias is around, I would say average is probably about 1.8 milligrams a day. So we often, and this is how I was trained. I don't prescribe because I'm not a nurse practitioner, but I've done loads and loads of training because I really wanted to walk through the process myself and understand it deeply. We'll often start a woman maybe on like 0.5 milligrams and do that for a week to 10 days. How do you feel? Are your symptoms getting in? If, if she's symptomatic, are your symptoms getting any better? She's monitoring symptoms as she goes. Um, after about a week to 10 days, if they're not early, you know, if, if symptoms aren't alleviated or they're not reduced, which we typically don't expect, you know, we typically increase. So maybe it's 0.5 milligrams in the morning, 0.5 milligrams at night. So we're typically doing this very slow, slow titration with topical estrogen. And what's nice, it's in a cream oil or gel. So you're just rubbing it on the skin. Um, you're literally like on your wrist, there's different areas on the body. We can rub it, but it gets rubbed into the skin for progesterone. Same thing. You know, the really, I think stellar menopause providers will often give a woman a couple of different progesterone prescriptions. You know, typically women are around, I would say the bulk of the women are somewhere between like hundred milligrams and maybe 200 milligrams of oral progesterone. Some are down at 50 milligrams, some a little bit more, but that's probably average. Yep. Um, if you can start a woman low, maybe she gets a prescription for a 25 milligram bottle and a 50 milligram bottle. And she's sort of starting slowly with one and increasing, and you, we can kind of, you know, play with it a little bit more until she gets to her kind of perfect dose. And there's a list of typically symptoms. We'll say, you know, monitor this list, this list of symptoms. You know, if they're, if your symptoms are getting better, great, keep going, keep increasing. If you have symptoms of excess back down to the previous dose. So it's very, very there's a lot of instructions given with HRT. It's not difficult, but it's just a matter of finding your right dose. I love what you said about, you know, the week before your period that you're using a little bit of progesterone. That's a possibility as well. Sometimes if it's early perimenopause, maybe it's just a little bit of progesterone to help subsidize that second half of the cycle, because maybe you're not really robustly producing progesterone. Maybe you need it, you know, every day of the cycle, maybe it's a little bit of estrogen second half. So there's a lot of possibilities and customizations. Um, and that's why the menopause specialists are so, so important. Yeah. I um, yeah. So, yeah. and testosterone is unique. It could be, you know, I would say women are typically somewhere around about two milligrams per day topically again, mm -hmm. but that depends. There's a lot of nuances. So I don't want to like 
hold me to anyone because it depends the carrier that they're in. So they're, they're like only about 1% of your prescription is actually the hormone. If it's topical, the other 99% is the cream or oil or gel it's mixed into. Yeah. Yeah. So the cream matters. So it may not be delivering well. So the hormone ju- adjust- adjustments sometimes need to be made based on many different yeah. factors. I love it. Yeah. And in my scenario, I'm also taking oral DHEA daily, mm-hmm. and I'm mm-hmm. also adding in Prairie Marifica on oh. a regular basis for this. But um, okay. And so then one of the beauties of these creams is now you can mix the cream. So you've got your estrogen, you have your testosterone, and you have your DHEA potentially all mixed together. And we know that testosterone has a super short Mm -hmm. half-life. Do you think it's a good idea for a woman to get a cream where it's all mixed together and save her time? Or do you really like it to be separated out so we can have the finesse and the timing um, personalized for where they are in any 28-day cycle? I do. I like to have them separated out. I think from a convenience standpoint, I, especially as you're starting out, separation is absolutely key because if you, if you're just putting them all in one and putting it on, you're not going to know what's what. So separate at the beginning, I still personally like them separate anyway, just because, Mm -hmm. you know, estrogen, if we're using estrogen, we're typically from, uh, this is, this is, I guess, in my experience, using it twice a day. So maybe morning and, and at night progesterone is oral. So that's typically just at night testosterone is more energizing. So we want to use that in the morning, not necessarily right before we go to bed, unless maybe we're, you know, um, (laughs) looking to get intimate. Maybe we'll use it before bed. Maybe we would do that. But in general, we want to have a little bit more control over that. And especially if we're still in perimenopause, you know, cycle, there's some, there's some zhuzhing and playing that needs to be done. And we may know that certain, we, if we know ourselves well, yeah. we may know when our hormones are really rocking and rolling and we may want to pull back on one, but not the other. So I think keeping them separate can be really, really beneficial. And just to, uh, for me, I, I'm curious if you agree with this. I really think that as we track our cycles and we really get to know ourselves, this is whether or not you're bleeding. The, the moon pulls tides. We're talking about a 28 day cycle here. And mm-hmm. even for women beyond menopause, as you track it, you'll notice that there are rhythms. And so you can utilize those rhythms and so to really finesse and zhuzh, yeah. <laughs> I love that word, <laughs> the, the hormones that are being added. Um, yeah. Okay, a side note question. I've had a woman come to me and ask, and I had a great conversation with a friend of mine that's a pharmacist. Mm-hmm. For women that are using intravaginal mm-hmm. hormone replacement therapy mm-hmm. or bioidenticals, mm-hmm. and then there's contact with their sexual partner, mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the sexual partner then being exposed to the creams and potentially absorbing the hormones and navigating that? They definitely, that is something to consider. And I I always tell women, you know, if you are using it vaginally, you don't want to use it vaginally and then, you know, be with your partner. Um, The same is true. Even if it's on your skin, if you, you know, you can share it on your sheets. I mean, that is actually, there are stories of husbands, things have happened, things that, you know, where it's been sort of, going to, through this root cause analysis, you, we realize, oh, it was actually the sheets. There was transference on the sheets. Yeah. So if you are using it locally in the vagina, we want to avoid contact and it will stay there a little bit longer. Um, you know, it's in that space. So we definitely want to avoid co- sexual contact at that point. Mm-hmm. So we want to use it a time outside of when we would maybe be, you know, intimate with our partner for sure. There's a lot of benefit to using, you know, estrogen vaginally, especially in women who have had significant, maybe vaginal atrophy, that tissue is just, it thins, it can, you know, you think about, I think about it as like crepe paper, just it thins, it's not as juicy. So especially if you're a woman who's maybe further out or you've been without estrogen for a while, or maybe you're further along and you really notice changes down there, using it locally, it may not have to be long-term. Maybe you're just using it to sort of help get some of that tissue integrity back. And then maybe you switch to maybe systemic is just fine for you. Putting it on your skin, it will still reach the vaginal vault and and get to that area. Um, Sometimes we use some local um, estrogen, um, sometimes DHA, sometimes other things just to help get that tissue kind of back. Mm -hmm. I've Mm -hmm. even seen it really helpful postpartum. Yes. Yes. Ah, we've, We've covered a lot. We have covered a lot. We have. Anything else that feels important to you? Um, We didn't talk endocrine disruptors. I don't know how much time you have. Um, Jill, anything else that you want to add? Yeah, I think it's this. um, I think we want, I think I always want women to understand that since hormones have been changing since our 20s, 
Um, it's not an overnight thing. Our body's been kind of adapting, 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 adapting to these changes. And so by the time we've reached perimenopause and menopause, you know, oftentimes women, a lot of women are hanging by a thread, not all, but some are, are really hanging by a thread and wanting this quick turnaround. Well, I just want this right now. And if it's not better right now, there's a process to this. And so I always tell women when you're starting HRT, it give yourself six months because it's, it's, and that is a good thing. It's a titration process to make sure that it is absolutely perfect for you. And if it's not going well, if symptoms are getting worse, you need to reach back out to your doctor. That should not be happening. A lot of women will say, I tried it. It didn't work. There are so many nuances with HRT. There's so many different dosages. There's so many different forms. There's so many ways to change things around to make sure it works for you. And if you're doing, I always say, keep track of symptoms, whether it's a you know, typical menopausal symptom or something else. Hey, I'm super fatigued. I don't know why, or I'm super moody. All of these things for a menopause trained practitioner, they're going to know what that means. Oh, that's really tied to estrogen. Oh, that's really tied to progesterone. So it really helps to kind of paint the hormonal picture. So I always say, track your symptoms because we can't remember what we did yesterday. We're not going to remember <laughs> those symptoms as much as we think that we are. Keep track along the way. It's so, so important. And the only other thing is that, and this is, is, is I hope this changes. This is changing in the UK. I'm super excited to see that. But in the United States, our healthcare system is not designed to have an hour long conversation with your doctor about menopause. And that's really what we, what is required when we're starting HRT, when we're talking about benefits versus risk, when we're getting all of our questions answered, when we're getting all of the instructions we need to have as we go forward and get this prescription and we know what to do and we feel really good about it, you will probably have to pay out of pocket for this visit. And I know that feels daunting to some women, um, but I think about it as an invest, think about it as an investment in yourself. You're not going to be paying forever and ever and ever for hour long visits with your doctor, but right out of the gate, the first visit, it typically is about an hour. And for most doctors who are menopause trained who want that hour with you, they're going to probably work outside of an insurance plan because they know how important it is to have this conversation. Yep. So just kind of know that out of the gate and um, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. I also want to add, and in, in Jill, let me know if you agree with this. People, women will say, oh, I use this menstrual tracker app. Mm -hmm. And for me, I've never found one that, in my opinion, is comprehensive enough to really pick up the nuances and the variety of the symptoms that we're, that we should be tracking here. Should's a strong word that I'd like for you to be tracking. Yeah. So I've developed my own tracker. For those of you in the Women's Vibrancy Code, it's there in the portal. For those of you listening in the podcast, I'll put it as a free resource down below. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a Google sheet. It's something that's printable, but use it and keep in mind the laundry list of things that we're thinking about. And as mm -hmm. you track over a three month period, you're going to see patterns. And when you bring that for the women in women's vibrancy code, although I'm not prescribing because they're all over the country in the world, mm -hmm. I'm still helping you understand how to see that tracking that you're and the patterns and help you understand the relationship with the various hormones. And if you want to take the route of bioidentical hormones, or personalized supplementation that will then impact your hormones, we can allow the zhuzh and the finesse based on what we know, and then adding in testing. I like the Dutch test. I know it's not perfect and it's just grabbing a snapshot in time, but it's something and it's one more variable that we can add in. Um, Jill, anything you'd wanna to add to that? No, I love what you said about the tracker. It's so funny. I just literally created a Google sheet like a month ago, same thing because I wasn't able to capture everything. I'm like, there's nothing that captures it all. And yeah. I love what you said about the patterns, because if you really look, you will see patterns if you're paying attention and if you're tracking. And I know it's a pain a little bit to track, but there's so much value in that. Like you just said, Mariah, it's, it's, it really will help you to, to walk in and feel confident. Like I'm looking at this and I've been tracking it. We live in our bodies 24 seven. We get this little tiny one hour visit or 10 minute visit with our doctor. So this tracking outside of, of our medical visit is so, so important. So I love that you said that. Yeah. Um, 
for a woman who's listening and she wants to lean in, reach out to you. Mm-hmm. I have your website, your Instagram, pausing together membership community. That will all be in the show notes. And for those listening to the recording in the Women's Vibrancy Code, we'll make sure that that's added into the module. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you prefer a woman reaches out to you? In what ways do you support women? What does it look like for women to work with you? This is your chance to kind of step yeah. on your box and yeah. <laughs> teach your own horn a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, so I stopped seeing one-to-one patients about a year, a little over a year and a half ago, um, really to focus on the broader education. I just felt really called to do that. So um, that's where this membership community, it's cheap too. It's like $9 and 99 cents a month. This is, it's, it's similar, you know, from a platform perspective, it looks like Facebook. It's just not in Facebook. I just wanted a place where women there's content, but where they could ask questions. So you know, obviously I can't give, you know, personalized medical advice to women there, but this is where I welcome lots and lots of questions. And there's lots of resources for women there. Women can certainly reach out on Instagram. You can email me. Um, but I would say if you're wanting more of that kind of like back and forth conversation or some touch points, um, that's a great place to go because there's content. I have a, I actually have a menopause specialist that comes in every two weeks and does a Q and a for our members to answer questions. He's been a menopause specialist for 30 years. So There's lots and lots of questions that have been answered and it's all recorded and it's all easy to find. So that's really helpful if you've got a lot of questions about perimenopause and menopause. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for those of you in the Women's Vibrancy Code, Jill and I've started a conversation. I'm really curious to see where it goes, but I I can see lots of ways in which I can integrate you into just coming in occasionally Mm -hmm. as a guest expert within Women's Vibrancy Code and adding um, your expertise. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks you guys for being on the call. This was really, really fun. It's a topic that is near and dear to my heart and so important that we all understand this so we can really advocate for what we need, whether it's hormones or not. There's no judgment either way. I just want women to know what hormones do in their body and then they can decide what the right route is for them and not to be afraid of them because we shouldn't be afraid of our hormones. And to really make sure that it's bioidentical going on synthetic progestins or estrogen is not the same scenario, okay? Jill, thank you for your time. This will also be stored in the Women's Vibrancy Code Program portal. And so women will be able to resource this and go back and watch it in their leisure and in their own timing. And hopefully it will continue to create a ripple effect and change lots of lives. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Um, And with that, until next time. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.